I would like to wish everyone my auspicious greetings. And today we will continue teaching the on the four dharmas of Gampopa. So in the past couple of days, I've spoke about how Dharma becomes the Dharma. In particular, there's the meditation on death and permanence. The second is the meditation on karma, cause and effect. And the third, and so I've, talk, excuse me, I've spoken about those as I see them in brief. And so I'd like to speak now a little bit about the defects of samsara. So gentlemen, when we talk about meditating upon the faults of samsara, this is a practice for the middling type of individual. But here, when we're saying the 
the Dharma became the Dharma, and we're primarily talking about the practice of the lesser type of individuals, why are we trying to cram this one in at that same time? So when we think about the way things are done in the teachings and done in the teachings in general, the order of the four dharmas follows the progression of the lesser, middling, and greater individuals. But when we emphasize the interests of individual students, there are ways even in the context of the first dharma to combine it with the practices of the two or three types of individuals and teach individual ways uh, for, the, for the dharma to become the dharma for individuals. So within our te this text that we're speaking about today, not only is the order a little bit different, but also in other texts by Gampopa, he speaks about how the Dharma becoming the Dharma can be the worldly way of Dharma becoming the Dharma or the way of the Dharma becomes the Dharma of Nirvana. So he spoke about it in these two different ways. And so these, the, the point for saying this is, as I described before, the points are describing uh, the, two, uh, the two ways of the Dharma becoming the Dharma. When we talk about the, when we talk about becoming the worldly Dharma, this means believing the correct worldly view of karmic cause and effect, not accumulating misdeeds for the sake of this life and accomplishing virtue for the sake of the next. That is how we should understand it. So it's just, just as in the particular teaching, the Gloria Sakya, the four partings from attachment where it says, if you are attached to this life, you are not a practitioner. So being a practitioner, that means someone who practices the Dharma, means that at the very least you have the aim of practicing Dharma for, uh, with an aim toward the next life and beyond. And so that's how we should understand it. And someone who has that broader view and broader aim is what we call a Dharma practitioner. In addition to that, if you have the wish to seek freedom or the wish to be liberated from samsara, that is just piling good upon more good. And so thus saying the Dharma becomes the Dharma, and practicing the Dharma for the sake of future lives mean the same thing. So to sum it up, no matter how much Dharma you practice, if your aim is only for the sake of this life, that is not actual Dharma practice. So when we talk about meditating upon the faults of samsara, how should we understand it? If we continue to remain in samsara, we will have no power, no, no control in samsara. But if we achieve liberation, we will have control. And understanding this, we have the wish to achieve uh, liberation from samsara. And then we put effort into the methods for doing so. So if we, the reason, the primary reason why we will have no control if we remain in samsara is that we are under the control of the karma and of karma and the afflictions. So that is what it comes down to. But it is difficult for us to immediately see the faults of karma and the afflictions. It's not easy to see that. but it's a bit easier to see and understand the faults, the results of those to his suffering. And so that is the main reason why meditating on the faults of samsara is primarily meditating on the suffering of samsara. So in this text on the uh, uh, four dharmas, uh, I've already, I have already read the passage on how to meditate on the faults of samsara. Uh, one time yesterday, but I'll read it again. So as the, the text, the four dharmas in brief reads, the best is the human and God realms, 
But even there, there is the suffering of birth, aging, death, looking for what you lack, protecting what you have, crossing paths with hostile enemies, and losing loving friends. For the gods, the suffering of dying and falling is 16 times greater than that of the incessant hell. No matter whether you take birth in the six realms, there is only suffering. Until you feel this and reach a level of disgust, you, the Dharma will not become Dharma. So that is the text. So at this point, I thought I would uh, explain some of my own um, opinions about the faults of samsara. And what we, what we often say is that in samsara, there's not even a pinprick's worth of happiness. So why isn't there any happiness? Many people don't understand this. Many people think, oh, everything's fine for me now. I don't have any suffering. And if, I, if, if I could be reborn in the, in the heavens, the gods, then that would be great, wouldn't it? So why are we saying that there's nothing but suffering? You think that this is like kind of a strange or kind of a crazy to say this. But, but when you talk about suffering usually, and how do we, under, how do we usually understand suffering? It's like when our bodies, when we're not physically feeling good, when we're physically not feeling good, such as when we have a stomach ache or, or, uh, or when we're sad in, in our minds. But in, basically what we mean is the, uh, the, experience, the sensations we experience in our body or mind that are unpleasant. And that's what we mean. But among the three types of suffering we speak about, this is the suffering of suffering, only the suffering of suffering. And so if we only understand suffering as being that, then we have too limited an understanding of it, or too narrow understanding. When we talk about samsara being uh, suffering, then the suffering you mean is even more uh, subtle than that, even more deeper than that, and also vaster. And if we go a little bit more subtle than the suffering of suffering, then we get to the suffering of change. And the suffering of change, there are many ways to identify it, but, but if we think about it in terms of experience in this life, in any time in our daily lives, suffering could happen at any point. There are many adversities that can happen to us. For example, we could get sick at any time. We could lose our jobs at any time. We could, uh, we could lose our investments at the same time. We could be separated from our parents and our brothers and sisters at any time. Our, our uh, friends and our lovers are willing to leave us at, or could leave us at any time. And so when we think about this, in the way, even if we worry about this might happen, so we often worry about this. And at the same time, there are the natural disasters, war and conflict and so forth. And like last year, there was last year, there was the coronavirus epidemic. And I, this is a situation where we had nothing to do and we had no idea what we should do. And these situations could happen, could happen at any time. And in particular, there is, there is one, uh, one hidden situation that could happen to us at any time. And what that situation is, is we could die at any time. And when we die, then we'll be separated from everything in this lifetime. And then we're separated from that all. And that is suffering. So in this, for that reason, in our lifetimes, we have many situations where we have no control. And we have no, many situations where we have nothing to do. And it's our life is filled with these situations. Uh, but often they are, they just aren't evident to us right now. But if we are actually to think about it, think about it carefully and relax and let ourselves think about it, then all of the, 
then we would see that, you know, always thinking that we need to uh, save money or that we need to take care of our body or that we need to make good connections with people and always do things to mollify them. We'd see that there's really not much reason to doing any of that. If this lifetime was always just right and always excellent as we wished it to be, then there wouldn't be any reason for us to feel fear or um, apprehension, nor anything that we would feel like we'd uh, hide so that other people wouldn't learn about it, or any regret over the things that we shouldn't have done but did, uh, or being depressed over the things we wanted to do but couldn't do. Uh, or being left alone when there's no friends, or, uh, or various other feelings that happen, that there would be no reason for feeling them at all. Now, the third type of suffering is a suffering of uh, formation. This is even more subtle or even deeper than the suffering of change. This, uh, this sort of suffering is something that we cannot uh, sense with, feel with our senses. We don't know about it. And it's not just a, a circumstance that never, an unprecedented circumstances. It's just the suffering of the essence or the nature. For example, to give, to give an example, if someone was put in prison, Even if they didn't have much suffering of, be, of illness or of hunger and thirst, being in that prison environment would be suffering, or the, that would be the nature of that would be suffering. And that type of suffering is the suffering that we mean when we say that there is not even a pinprick's worth of happiness in samsara. It's that suffering that we're can experience at any moment. It's the way we should understand it when we say that uh, the nature of samsara is suffering. Is that in our lifetimes, do we actually have any control? We really don't have control. We don't have any actual control. For example, the, what we wish, we have the wish to do everything that we think about it, that we'd like to do. But in the actual situation, in actual fact, can we do everything that we'd like to do? We cannot. You can't think of do everything you'd like to or you think of. We always think we're going to get, we're going to lose something, or we're going to miss an opportunity, or that someone is going to leave us, or that uh, people are going to... Uh, we, we always have these worries about this. We always feel like we need to mollify or make other people happy. Or we often think that we need to have, if we could have a bit more money and so we save some money. Or we try to get a, a better education than others, or if we work a bit harder, so to sort of inspire our family, uh, our family members. And we work hard for these things. Likewise, in our lifetime, there are many situations where we just run out of things to do. For example, even if you don't like the people in your uh, in your homeland, the in your in your hometown, uh, for the sake of, of people, you stay in a place where you don't like, and you uh, do a job that you don't like, and. Uh, you stay. You stay at that. Stay in your home. In your hometown, just just for that reason. It's like you don't have any choice. And so, and because of these situations where you like have so many hopes or fears, or where you run out of things to do, what that shows is that we don't have anything to do. We don't have any control. It's like we don't have anything to, we can do to get out of the suffering. And so because it's such situations, 
the, the situation is like that. And so for that reason, is actually very similar to being uh, thrown in prison. What's different is that is that there's not a very, in a prison, there's not a large area to move around. When we think about a prison, we think about a, a confined area. But this entire earth is like our prison. So other than the difference of, uh, than how much space we have to move around, it's actually the same as a prison. So we're all like prisoners. There are a lot of rules about what it's okay to do and what it's not okay to do. There's always like people are always uh, evaluation of our uh, of our behavior saying if you're going to be a good person, behave like that. If you're a bad person, you think uh, doing that. They're also like pay, always paying attention to the way people see us. We always uh, we always evaluate ourselves against that. Likewise, they're the aims for what we want to do and the uh, the activities that we need to do. And we need to, and there are many situations that we get together and then we wait for them. And so for that reason, we can't just spend every day, take a day off every day and and enjoy ourselves. We have to do a lot of work and we have to do a lot of study. And if we think, if we, maybe if we have some helper or some companion, if like we, uh, then we get married. And if you get married, but then a few years later, then staying in your, in your family home, it can be like, can start to feel like being in a prison, right? So in brief, we think we have freedom. We think that we're pretty well off, but this is because we, we are unable to, it means like we have, uh, we don't have such a high level that we're aiming for, or because there's a certain situation that we've been able to grow used to, and because of that, we uh, think that we have control, but actually, in, the, in, in fact, we do not have any freedom or control. We are under something else's control. And so that's, suffer, that's samsara. And so what's the reason why we need to cycle in samsara? Is there any way, like we have no choice but to stay, be stuck in samsara? Is there any way we can not only do we have no other way, but who's but who's uh, evaluating? Who's judging us? Who is uh, who, under whose control are we in? And who is it who's evaluating? Who's keeping track of us? It is the karma and afflictions that we. In the actual situation, we have lost all our freedom to karma and afflictions. So we have to go because we've lost our our freedom. We have to go wherever. For example, it's like we uh, take dogs on a walk. It's the same. Here you put the dog on a leash and you take it outside, right? So the dog itself doesn't have any have any control. It has to go wherever the um, the owner takes them. Similarly, so within our lives, some people see that they have a situation where they have nothing to do and they have no control. And when they see that, and they're unable to accept this when it happens. And so some people start drinking and some people smoke or even worse, they, drink, they take drugs and they do various things in order to be able to relax. But this is the same as giving up the main thing and just grabbing the branch, giving up the trunk and give, grabbing the branches because when you're drunk, and then when you sober up, then your the feelings will come back again. And so for that reason, what's the what's the what's the real thing we can do to to free ourselves from suffering, to free ourselves from some sorry? What's the how can we actually gain uh, freedom? It's to do what we can to free ourselves from samsara. So freeing ourselves from samsara is samsara a place? It's not a place. 
for example, if we, if even if we, uh, even if we were to leave this earth and fly into space, it wouldn't it wouldn't change anything. We'd still have no freedom. The situation would be the same. It's not that uh, that samsara happens because there's a problem with the place where we are. Samsara is related to our mind. If the place were samsara, then all the individuals who had achieved accomplishment, the nobles who had realized the true nature of things, wouldn't remain on earth with us, would they? In brief, samsara is inside our own minds and and the and the person who's in control or the, of, of it and the person who keeps us there at the common and, affle and afflictions and so we need to understand we, we need to understand from all perspectives what is suffering we need to understand it from a deep and profound level this is important to to understand so uh, suffering doesn't just mean the suffering of having a stomach ache, or it's not just the suffering of oh, this year I didn't get a, a an iPhone 12, and then being disappointed over that. If you think that is suffering, that's not right. But as I said before. The way, but it's difficult for us to actually understand what is meant when we say that there's no, that all of samsara is suffering. And the reason is because we've never experienced being freed from the bind, bond, bonds of suffer, of karma and afflictions. And so when we say being freed from that, we'd have, we, can, uh, we don't know how to understand, so we forget about it. It's like the, it's like saying, we just don't know how, to, know how to think about it. Usually when we think about suffering, uh, suffering is greater, something we compare it to another, right? When you have a small, some, a small suffering compared to a larger, you know that, and when you compare being unhappy with happy, then you understand what it is. But if you have nothing to compare it to, you don't know. It. So it's like, it's like the example saying, like the saying of saying there's nothing wrong if you don't compare it to anything. So for... The, we don't understand the uh, freedom or the happiness that the noble beings have freed themselves from suffering and achieved liberation from suffering and the pleasure they experience at liberation. It's just something we just have no idea what it can be. We can't even think about it. Similarly, And we also don't even, we don't even, we aren't even able to think or understand that we could have that same uh, control and pleasure of being freed from suffering, like those uh, suffering, like, like those uh, noble individuals. And so now when we have the, so now in our lifetime, sometimes when you get very busy, so when we're working or when things get, uh, get get kind of hectic, then you have to take a break and relax. Just think, can we be able to liberate ourselves from suffering or not? Do we have to go someplace else or not? We have to look at that. Say, can we go or not? And so does this depend upon going to a different place, to a different place? We think if we get to, I think, if we get to the realm of Sakavati, then we'll achieve uh, happiness. If we go someplace else, then we'll get happiness. Is that how it is? And does it depend on whether or not you can get to some other place? It doesn't depend on whether you go someplace else. If it depended upon uh, getting going to another place, then all the individuals who have achieved liberation all of the uh, all of the individuals in India and Tibet who had achieved uh, accomplishment would have already gone to Sakavati. The main point comes down to comes it comes down to your mind. 
And no matter how excellent the external things you have, no matter how wonderful they are, the actual, they cannot actually remove your fundamental difficulties. Your actual difficulty is, uh, is not a difficulty of not having excellent or external, thing, external things. And so for that reason, you need to train your mind and improve your mind. Then only then can you actually dispel your actual difficulties. depends upon whether you uh, improve your own mind or not. Whether you've trained your mind or not, that's what it depends upon. And so that is in brief about the faults of samsara. These are just a few opinions about opinions of mine about it. And so in brief, for Dharma to become the Dharma, as I described yesterday, you first have I first explained what what is Dharma that has not become Dharma and how what is the way that Dharma can become Dharma so I've explained uh, all of that so now what is the measure or the signs of uh, whether Dharma has become the Dharma so the there are two nef uh, the uh, in terms of Gampo, Gampopa and his nephew, there was a, a Gampo, Gampo Tsutu Nimbo, and his direct disciple was Shang Tsapa, who was uh, an un, uh, undisputed Siddha and the founder of the Tsapa Kaiju. And so here there is a quote from him. It's kind of a, it's a summary of the Dharma becoming the Dharma. If I don't put a, get, conclude this talk about the... Uh, of uh, this conclude this talk about the Dharma becoming the Dharma, then there'd be the danger that instead of having a teaching on the four Dharmas of Gampapa, we'd only have a teaching on the first. So what Shang Tsapa said is, in brief, for the Dharma to become the Dharma, as you practice it, it improves day by day, likewise month by month and year by year, and you're continually grow more and more comfortable. The afflictions will become less and less other than just figuratively, from your depths, you will be able to take more and more defeats upon yourself. Your character will get better and better. Your desires for this life and such will become less and less. Your pride and haughtiness will get less and less. You will feel this yourself, and your guru and companions will sense it too. So your awareness will go cleaner and cleaner and your mind happier and happier. It should be so that no matter what side you look at, you feel no regret. We wander in samsara because of not taming our being. Thus, if something doesn't become an antidote for the afflictions and does not tame your being, what good is it? What has it helped to practice Dharma by listening, contemplating, and meditating, and so forth? From your heart, you need to implant this in your mind. This is a really important, important point, I think. In any case, when, we, when we're talking about teaching and practicing Dharma, we need to get better. We need to get better day by day. We need to get uh, next month. We need to be better. We need to improve next month compared to this month. We need to improve next year. Our, our mind needs to get better and better. Our pride needs to get less and less. The afflictions need to get less and less. Our compassion needs to get larger and larger. Our pure, our pure perception needs to grow stronger and stronger. And we need to look and see, is this happening? It's not that you're just sort of looking. It's, you have to know it for yourself, actually. Uh, so you'll know this for yourself, and then your your guru and your fr friends will also see this. Not only that, but also all the lama, all the yidams and dharma practitioners who are in the w realm of wisdom will see it, and they'll know it. So that's what needs to happen. Otherwise, if you spend uh, years or months practice, if you don't improve at all, 
If you don't improve at all, then that's a sign that there's a problem, that you don't know how to practice the Dharma. There's a situ- there's something's happened. If it's the opposite, then you're getting worse and worse, then there's no point in talking about it. If, you're, if, if you practice Dharma and, you're, and you get more and more proud, there's not even any discussion about whether the Dharma is becoming the Dharma. If the reflections are getting stronger and stronger, and then you're finished. Then forget about being a Dharma, Dharma practitioner. That's how it is. So next, I'd like to speak. I need to speak a little bit about the Dharma beginning the path. I have to speak a bit about this, don't I? So, so to speak about this in brief. When we say the Dharma becoming the path, what this means, and to to say it in brief, to sum it up is that our practice of giving up misdeeds and practicing a virtue should not only be for the sake of the next lifetime. Instead, it should be for the a, a way to achieve this, uh, the state of any of the three vehicles. That is what we should understand it as. So Dukun Chopa said, thus, even if, you're, if the Dharma becomes the Dharma, the Dharma must become the path. If you turn your mind away from this away from this life, but still seek a pleasant samsaric result, such as the state of gods and humans in your next life, the Dharma has not become the path. Thus you must know that all of samsara is suffering by nature. And so this is what he said. It is like that. That is what the way dharma, that is the way that dharma becomes the path. So it is generally accepted that the dharma becoming the path uh, should be joined with a practice of the middling of the middling type of individual who seeks enlightenment of the listeners and pratyeka buddhas, but. But that's not necessarily so, because uh, as we described when talking about the Dharma becoming the Dharma. For example, Gambopo said in his great collection of uh, Dharma talks, after speaking, when, at the point where he speaks about the Dharma becoming the path, he says, for the Dharma becoming the path, there are two, becoming the basis of the path and becoming the actual path. Becoming the basis of the path uh, faults of the foundation vehicle in all the stages of gathering and virtuing and vir- purification and practice, you are motivated by loving kindness, compassion, and bodhicitta. Then, in order to bring all sentient beings throughout space to uh, unexcelled enlightenment, you practice in order to develop the wish to de- definitely achieve the in- omniscient Buddhahood with the three kayas and five wisdoms. This is the basis for the path. Becoming the actual path means recalling that the relative is like dreams and illusions. And all the uh, Dharma activities you do, whether greater or middling, you practice them like dreams and illusions with loving kindness, compassion, and bodhicitta, with means and prajna, never separate. In this way, the Dharma becomes the path through these two. So here, he's basically teaching it how uh, it be, uh, the Dharma becomes the Mahana path by way of the union of emptiness and compassion. Likewise, Floyapa wrote in his commentary on the four dharmas. Now, in order to explain the dharma becoming the path in particular, it says the path and so forth. This is classified into two types, the provisional and an ultimate, and of these two. So he's he's saying that there is the provisional way of it becoming the uh, path of the listeners and Pratika Buddhas, uh, Buddhas, and there's the ultimate way that it becomes the Mahayana path. So in this text on the four Dharma text, what it says is, is for, uh, where, where the practice of the middling editions has already been discussed in the passage on the Dharma becoming the Dharma. So the passage on Dharma becoming a Dharma, the, the becoming the path primarily teaches how it becomes the path. So if you read the, uh, the text, uh, the, the words of the text, it says, for the Dharma to become the path, you must have loving kindness and compassion, cherish others more than yourself, and develop the relative bodhicitta. 
in addition, you should understand that all external and internal phenomena are appearances assembled through interdependence, like dreams and illusions. And so to, uh, only then only the Dharma will become the path. So here there's a he's speaking about a type uh, typographical error in the Tibetan. So, so at this point, there is a very vast uh, understanding of the Dharma becoming the path. And if we were to teach it all, it would take two or three days. But this, in this occasion, we haven't much time. Today, I don't think I can teach it. So tomorrow, I will speak about it. I'll speak about how the Dharma becomes the path in brief. So tomorrow, there are three, how the Dharma becomes a path, how the path dispels confusion, and how the confusion arises of wisdom. So it might be a little difficult. And one day, talking about three three vast topics in a single day is a little difficult. So so I've been thinking about it. And so what what can we do? So I think that I don't think there's much point to extending it by another day. It would be, be kind of like always when you're when you're making a tsampa, that when you don't know how to do it first, you put in a little bit of uh, put add a little of tea, and you put in too much, so then you put in more tsampa. Then you've got too much tsampa, so you put in more tea, and then you've got too many teas, so you put more tsampa. And at the end, <laughs> you've got so much. You've, you've, you end up with so much samba that you don't know that you can't possibly eat it in one day and you have to spend two or three days. So if I add a day every day, then it would be a little bit strange. And so for that reason, so I, we won't extend the teaching any further. However, even if we don't extend the teaching, we'll probably need to lengthen it by one hour. So tomorrow, we will go from, we'll have one session from seven to eight. Then we'll have a half hour break and then from 8.30 Indian time to 9.30, we will have, so we'll have, if I can teach it in two hours, then I think I can probably teach it all. So for the shadows, even if there's a little, uh, let us, please let me know. But uh, Jenna, I'm a little, a little bit tired myself. It's not just an hour for me, it's like, I th I've spent my entire day thinking about this and working on it. It's a bit difficult, but but I feel that the, I have such a wonderful opportunity to teach the Dharma that I think actually I'm really fortunate. And so thinking that way, I'd, you know, give myself a little bit of enthusiasm and do the practice. And so please, all of you, keep this in mind. So thank you. So today, so I have to take a little bit of a break and um, and relax a bit. Otherwise, I'll uh, we'll get a little bit start feeling a little under the weather. <laughs> Oh, yeah, 
so tomorrow at the end, we will, I thought we would recite the Mahamudra aspiration tomorrow at the end of tomorrow's session. So please everyone bring a copy of that. Many of you have it memorized. I think you can just recite it right away. So you probably don't need to bring your text. In any case, another thing I always think is when we read the text, in the John Conjure, it's different. The, uh, in the John Conjure, it says, uh, may be swiftly freed from the ocean of samsara in the John Conjure edition. So I think that's a little bit better. Uh, and so it says, uh, I think that's a little bit better saying, may we be uh, uh, free ourselves swiftly. So please, thank you. Thank you.